We are here today with Professor Susan Hallam. You have been Professor of Education at the Institute of Education for quite a few years. I have indeed, since uh, about 2002. Right. And one of your main interests and fields of expertise is psychology of music. Absolutely. So what is the role of psychology of music in education? It's got a very important role. There are two kind of key elements to it. One is about learning um, and teaching, pedagogy. So issues to do with that, which covers musical ability, expertise and so on, um, all, all those kinds of things. And then the other area is really about the wider benefits of music in other areas of the curriculum, but life more generally. I have read so many things um, that you had written before I came as a student mm -hmm. at the Institute. And one of your articles that was published in 2010 was on the power of music. <coughs> it was the most downloaded article. Uh, so can you tell us a few things about the benefits uh, of participating in music? First of all, I'll tell you a story about how I got involved in this. Um, most people have heard about the Mozart effect mm -hmm. and when that was sort of raging in America you know and everybody was buying um, CDs for their children to you know their babies to listen to and so on the BBC had a program called Tomorrow's World which is a science program and they wanted to do an experiment which emulated the work that had been done in America on if you listen to 10 minutes of Mozart it's going to improve your IQ um, and they rang me up and said can you help us design this experiment? And in the end, we had something like 6,000 children um, in 300 schools, and they, ha they did one of three things. They either listened to 10 minutes of Mozart, or they listened to um, Blur, the pop group, um, on uh, Radio 1, or they, unfortunate ones, got me talking about science experiments. And then the teachers let them listen to this music, and then what happened after that was they all carried out some spatial reasoning tests. And then all the tests were brought to me at the Institute and I fed them into a database. And then we went live on uh, Tomorrow's World to announce the results. And um, we didn't quite replicate the Mozart effect. In fact, what happened was that there was a slight blur effect. So the people who were listening to the popular music did slightly better Hmm. than the, either the Mozart effect or those who were listening to me. And that was my first engagement, really, with you know, what music can do for you outside of music education. Right. And then after that, I got involved in all sorts of other things, which you're aware of, and the project we've been working on together now um, particularly focuses on music with older people. And how engagement in music supports the development of other skills, like numeracy, yeah. literacy? Well, what the evidence shows is that um, initially, particularly with literacy, um, it's about the way that we process sound. Mm. And the way we process musical sound is the same as the way we process speech. And you as a singer know that, anyway. Yeah. Um, but, but the outcome of that is that people, therefore, who have lessons in music and are doing singing and improving their listening skills, because of that, they then improve their the way that they can process language mm. and because of that um, therefore their language skills improve and then their uh, understanding of things like phonics because they can then relate the sound to what they see on the page and then we see an improvement in literacy. With maths it's more complicated because maths is not a unitary kind of subject, there's lots of sub bits mm -hmm. as you know and rhythm seems to play an important part in mathematics but we're not quite sure at the moment where, you know, wh which bits of maths fit with which bits of music. So mm. it's a kind of an evolving, an evolving story, really. I would like now to ask you a few questions about the project that um, we have both been involved yeah. in on the benefits of music for older people. Do you think that there is any difference between leading musical activities with uh, children and leading musical activities with older learners? I think there are some differences. They're more in, in the eyes of the, the people who are facilitating to some extent mm. um, because we know with older people they want to make a contribution in terms of bringing their vast experience and because they're adults therefore those who are facilitating take the time or should take the time at any rate to find out you know, what they're doing in their lives and what music they like and so on and so forth. Um, actually that may very well apply 
to schools, you know, to younger children. Not that they've got the experience, but they do have experiences of listening to music and what they like. Mm. Um, but of course, within the kind of more formal curriculum, teachers don't always take account of that. Uh, another area that you have written a lot about is the development of expertise mm. and I'm really interested in that because for my own PhD I looked at how choral conductors develop their expertise. Yeah. So how can musical expertise be developed? If I can just slightly preempt that because um, when music psychology was in its infancy mm. the focus was very much on musical ability and it paralleled um, the way that intelligence as a, as a general concept um, was developed. So there was a lot of testing of IQ and what those working in music psychology did was parallel that so they developed their own tests for musical ability. And because I suppose uh, resources were limited at, at the time for the number of people who could learn to play an instrument, what happened was these tests were then used in a blanket sort of way with a lot of children to identify those who had the best perception of music. So the tests were looking at things like can you tell the difference between high and low notes? Can you identify the differences between different rhythms? And then the people who scored highly on those were the ones who were given the opportunities. Now of course again you know what's happened we know that the more you engage with music the better you get on with these tests anyway so it's a bit of a kind of circular issue but I think what has changed in music has been this huge recognition through the expertise paradigm that actually to do well in music you have got to put in a lot of effort and time and this has shifted the balance between thinking about musical ability is something that's innate, that you're born with, you have or haven't got, um, and actually what is required to develop high levels of expertise, which is time, effort, practice, um, getting feedback about what you're doing well, all, all those kinds of things which contribute. I don't think we've totally sorted out the argument about whether there, is, there are some things which you inherit, because it's almost impossible to untangle it, That's true. isn't it? You know, it between, is. between where your experiences started and what you were born with. Because we know that you know, infants in the womb can hear sound, and if their mother has played particular pieces of music a lot, then when they're born they recognise mm. that. So you know, that learning process, which is part of developing musical expertise, starts so early that to begin to untangle genetic as opposed to learning, I think, is... I don't think it'll happen in my lifetime, yeah. maybe in yours, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe in yours, maybe in yours. Um, you have done so many research projects, you have written a lot of books, you have edited books with colleagues. What is the next step for you? I think that as you do research, what happens is as you find things out, you also find out more that you don't know. So it's not so much going into particularly new avenues, it's kind of developing you know, the areas where where I've already done a lot of work. I mean, practicing is a good example. Because as I talked about the expertise paradigm, some of the early work done in that paradigm said it was very simple. The more practice you did, then the better you would be. And that actually, it was a very um, linear kind of relationship. You know, it was really simple. So those who did more practice did better. Well, not all the evidence totally supported that. And so, because there were some people who achieved very similar levels of expertise, but some had done a lot more practice than others. So then you have to begin to untangle that. Well, is that because their practice is more effective in the time they're doing it? You know, do they work more efficiently and effectively? Is that part of the um, answer to that? And it might be part of it, but you know, what the research has now shown and some of what I've been doing is that's not totally the answer either. So you're constantly moving forward, looking, mm. you know, well, that throws up another issue. Is there something else? Are there wider things? Um, I mean, being a musician is not just about learning to play an instrument well. It's about being able to communicate with an audience. And it's about sort of being able to project sound and all these kinds of things, which are rather elusive and don't necessarily come out of that relationship between the amount of time you spent practicing and, you know, where you end up.